the research right now is showing that hackers that are either working for nation states or nation states themselves, uh, they've used open AI systems in the creation of cyber attacks. And this research comes from open AI and Microsoft, but instead of using AI to generate these exotic attacks that we were all worried about, the hackers, they've used it in pretty mundane ways. I'm Brad Bussey, Chief Information Security Officer here at E360. Thank you for joining me for the State of Enterprise IT Security Edition. This is the show that makes IT security approachable and actionable for technology leaders. I'm happy to bring you three topics this week. First, hackers from China, Russia, and other countries are using open AI systems. Second, Following up on our deep fake topic from last episode, Pindrop launches a real time audio deep fake detection tool, which they call Pindrop Pulse. And third, what will the Biden administration's new executive order on AI mean for cybersecurity? So, with that, let's get started. So, first topic today uh, hackers from China, Russia, and other countries, they are using open AI systems. And honestly, they're using other gen AI systems as well. But the research right now is showing that hackers that are either working for nation states or nation states themselves, uh, they've used open AI systems in the creation of cyber attacks. And this research comes from open AI and Microsoft, but instead of using AI to generate these exotic attacks that we were all worried about, the hackers, they've used it in pretty mundane ways. So they've leveraged open AI and others to draft emails, to translate documents, to debug computer code. So I find this a little bit interesting because everybody's worried about AI taking over the planet. But I've said this before, AI to me is augmented intelligence. And I think what the attackers are showing is that truly is the case. They're, they're using it just like everybody else. They're trying to be more productive in what they're doing. Granted, we don't want them to be more productive, but in essence, they're leveraging the gen AIs to augment things that they're already doing. Now, the companies didn't say which of the open AI technology and tools were being used. And what I like to see is that when they noticed this, they being open AI, they revoked access and they shut down the ability to use the platform for these hacker groups and nation states. Now, it's interesting because you, you think about this and you go, well, wait a second, you know, open AI, they've limited where customers could sign up for accounts, but it's really not that hard to fake where you are. And some of the sophisticated culprits, they just evade that kind of detection. They mask their location. They come through a VPN. I mean, there's, there's ways that they're going to do it, but honestly, they're signing up just like everybody else. And, they're putting in a credit card, like they're doing the things that, that all of us are doing to uh, sign up for the service. I find it interesting, Microsoft, they're tracking something like 300 hacking groups. And those include cyber criminals, nation states. And what they're leveraging is open AI to help track and disrupt uh, the use of gen AI for these hacking groups. So I think it's interesting that the attackers are using it and we as defenders are using it. And I think the thing that is making it a little bit harder for some of the defenders is the open source 
AI technologies, it makes the task a little bit harder to defend against because the attacks are coming from so many different places. They're not as predictable. And it's something that we're just, we're going to have to watch. So one person did ask me, they said, well, wait a second. If, if the attackers are using this technology, did that attack and the whole composition, was that used in the attack against Microsoft? So if you remember, there was a, a Russian group that attacked the Microsoft executives, but when they did their recon and their research, they found that they, they didn't actually use OpenAI or the uh, Microsoft solution to attack themselves. So I, I found that interesting. Second topic today, following up on last episode, we talked a little bit about deep fakes and there's a company, Pindrop. They launched a real-time audio deepfake detection tool, which they're calling Pindrop Pulse. So they unveiled this solution. And what they actually did, I, I found pretty interesting, is they, they proved that the voice cloning tech that was used to simulate President Biden's voice and mislead New Hampshire residents uh, they were able to pinpoint that it was simulated. They were able to pinpoint the technology that was used, and they were able in real time to flag it as a simulation. So what's what I find interesting is they can examine an audio sample for signs of synthetic content. And it and it's kind of a crazy number when you think about it. It's it's like 150 milliseconds to to do this. So what they do is they do a comprehensive detection. So the tool it categorizes synthetic audio, and they look for I think it's like four different fraud categories, and it covers a wide range of techniques from like something like a simple replay where someone says something, you capture the voice, and then you replay it, all the way down to a true AI-generated speech using samples. I would say it's a pretty versatile application. And what it's, what it's doing right now is it's aiming to combat the phone-based fraud. And that is something that is going, we're going to see a lot more of that during election season. and. This is something that's going to be helpful for uh, call centers. It's going to be, I hope, leveraged by political campaigns. And then it's, it's just like it's a rising attack surface. Uh, fake audio crimes, I think we're going we're gonna to see more and more of that. So this kind of technology is pretty exciting because you heard me last time throw a little bit of shade on some of the social media and, and just social networks on not policing their own platform. So when I see technology like this, it, it makes me excited because that means that there is going to be hope. If the socials aren't gonna do it themselves, then there will be third parties that can do this. So I'm excited because I think there's gonna be some further integrations with security products and, and pin drop and, and others. And I know that there's already been some early adoption. There's some clients that have been disclosed and they've already pulled in Pulse into their operations. And the big ones is securing call center communications to make sure that someone calling in is really the person. Because if some of you have ever done the voice authentication with your bank, if you can fake that, that's, that's a concern. So call centers are starting to pull this in to make sure that that kind of stuff is, um, is a little harder for attackers to do. So the third topic today, uh, you hear me talk about AI all the time. That's the time we live in. So third topic, what will the Biden administration's new executive order on AI mean for cybersecurity? So I found... You know, we all hear about this stuff. Some of us read it. Some of us listen to it. I'm a big fan of tell someone, then tell them what you told them. 
and then tell them again. And that's when you, you start to retain what you are hearing. So for those of you that don't know what the directive is or what it outlines, I'm just going to tell you real quick. So the directive, I, I'll just say some of the key components. Uh, it's the development of AI tools and test beds. So the Department of Energy, for example, they're tasked with developing an AI model evaluation tool. And this is to include safeguards. We're trying to mitigate risk and facilitate the creation of some foundational models. And that's really focused on scientific research. We're looking at critical infrastructure protection. So the National uh, Security Affairs and the OMB, they're coordinating their efforts to develop guidelines that the federal agencies will mandate for critical infrastructure protection. You heard me talk about this in a previous episode. Securing our critical infrastructure, it's a big deal. And nation states, they are definitely after our power, energy, uh, our water, and communications. So third thing, security reviews and public data access. I would say this is, this is focused right now around the chief data officer. There's a council and they've been tasked with creating guidelines for security reviews and public access to federal data. There is now a mandate around AI in the patent process and ultimately what that's going to look like and how if something is invented leveraging an ai like how are you going to patent that so they're trying to put some things around it uh training and risk mitigation so there's a bunch of different departments and that includes the homeland security labor health human services all of them have been directed to develop training programs best practices strategies and to mitigate anything that is risk related around AI. Uh, law enforcement has some mandates. So the attorney general, they're looking at best practices for law enforcement and their ability to leverage AI. There's a need for AI talent in government. So how are we going to bring up the next generation? Uh, and it's not like we're gonna bring up the next generation of generative AI, so to speak. It's the people that can create prompts it's those that understand the machine learning side of all of this that can create more sophisticated models because we're not to the point where ai is making itself yet uh, we're still in the augmented uh time it's going to be a little bit interesting once we do get to the time where ai is doing its own thing and um i'm sure some of you are thinking terminator and skynet i think about that stuff all the time so we'll just kind of see how that goes. I don't know what to do about that right now. Uh, then a lot of reports and guidelines. So there's a, there's a ton. Uh, I mean, the thing is like 43 pages uh, from the Biden administration. So uh, to be honest, you know, I started reading it and uh, made it through it. And then I said, you know, I was kind of distracted. So I actually asked ChatGPT. I took, I took the the order and I uploaded it and said, would you please summarize this for me? And it was actually pretty good. It gave me a lot of good uh, high level things and it helped to reinforce a lot of this. But what I was left with at the end of all of this was, is this order enforceable yet? And what I came up with is that this is very agency implementation heavy. So it really does hinge on the actions of various federal agencies. And as I think all of us know, some of them move fast, some of them move slow, and some of them move at the speed of stop. So it's really up to the agencies to make the necessary steps to implement the directives. So until they do that, I mean, the orders provisions really remain in the planning and development stages and they could stay there for a while. So we'll just have to see how that goes. There's 
really a lot of existing legal frameworks that I don't think were ready for AI. So there needs to be some updates and changes to some of the frameworks. And I think that's the only way to make things enforceable. And it really is going to depend on the current legal powers of the agency. This is, I would say that, that AI, securing AI, governing AI, it's, it's an ongoing development of standards and policies. NIST is still in the very early stages of their AI policy and their AI governance. It's good foundational knowledge, but that it's just going to take some time to mature. You heard me talk about in a, in a previous episode, some congressional action, who and how is the house using AI? How's the Senate using AI? And really, I think it's going to take some maturity in both areas to be able to enforce the aspects that we've talked about and, and roll it into uh, legislation. There, in all things I found in government, a good balance between public and private sector and the compliance therein. So if you look at like NIST 171 and some of the, the compliance frameworks that have been created so that a private entity can talk to a public entity, can exchange information safely, and there are safeguards that are put in place to facilitate that. Same thing needs to happen from a AI governance and security perspective. And that all of that stuff is still in the works. So enforceable, are we ready? Not quite yet. There is a time frame for implementation. It hasn't really been set in stone, but I think 2025 is a good target for some of these things to actually become enforceable. I think it's honestly going to take a lot longer than that. So thank you for tuning in and I will talk to you next episode.